Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. Hi, everybody. Kirk Henderson and Josh Bowe coming to you on the second night of a back-to-back. The Mavericks just got the absolute shit kicked out of them by the Golden State Warriors, 147 to 116. Josh, I would ask how you're doing, but you're probably doing better than the Mavericks, and that's going to have to be good. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Um, man, uh, what a what a game, huh? I just don't. I I'm sorry, Kirk. I know you're hosting, and usually whoever's hosting kind of kicks it to, to the uh, co-host to give them their initial takes. But I got it. I got. I, got, it. I, I go. gotta I say, go. I know. I'm just. Uh, this is like the third or fourth time, Kirk. You've kicked it to me to open a podcast. And I've literally been almost speechless because the issues have compounded upon themselves so much that I feel like a broken record at this point. I don't yeah. know what else to say. Yeah, I, I have a variety of our wonderful <laughs> listeners tweeting at me, expecting me to go nuclear. And I don't know, maybe I will later, but I'm just feeling I'm feeling very frustrated and disappointed, but more disappointed. Uh, at the 87 up mark, I said to our Slack, this is going to get out of hand. And you and I respond- called you out. Yeah, you were like, what are you talking about? And then the Warriors proceeded to go on a 16-2 to two run. <laughs> and where, where the game was lost was the Mavericks started getting beat to the cup sort of early on. It didn't really, really start to hurt them till the third quarter because the Warriors were making outside shots too. Um, and then things just, I knew things were going sideways when I saw Maxi Kleba get beat three times in a row off the dribble. Maxi Kleba only played 20 minutes. We didn't see much of him later. He must not, he must not be feeling great. You know, second night of a back to back, they traveled. COVID kicked the crap out of him, but. To see so little of our our arguable best man defender uh, says a lot to me about where they were tonight. And the Mavericks, you know, they're coming. You know, the the rational take on this game, you know, despite despite the fact that they got beat by like forty, is that they're playing on the second night of a back to back against a team that does not like nobody else plays like the Warriors. Like Kerr is very insistent on having tons and tons of off ball action in a way that was just so starkly con- contrasting to the Mavericks offense, which. I think we'll get to soon enough. And the way watching everyone get beat and watching the Mavericks try to implement their switch heavy system when you just have a bunch of dingbats, uh, you know, like watching Tim Hardaway get lost was is is really is really funny. Uh he played a great offensive game, obviously, but when the shots stopped falling, the Mavericks just exposed themselves. And I, I'm really not mad because i don't at this point i sort of expect it um it's you know watching Kristaps porzingis get scored on by a guy i've never heard on at the rim 
uh, fairly easily, I might add, was really was really painful. There's just so much wrong with this team, and they don't know how to get out of it. Um, we could really go everywhere on this because you said at one point, I'm not that worried about their offense. I mean, I am, but for different reasons. The defense is just so glaringly terrible that that I'm not sure what they do to fix it, right? Yeah, and I think what's really discouraging is they pitched such a great game literally 24 hours ago against Atlanta. And the way that they aggressively attacked Trey Young and forced the ball out of his hands and forced him from his comfort spots. And yeah, they got, uh, you know, uh, John Collins had an f- awesome game, but John Collins was also playing in space, you know, against a lot of four on three type situations because the Mavericks were like, you know what? We'll live they made, with. They made John Collins beat them instead yes. of, yeah, that was kind of the plan. Yeah. And they're like, we will take John Collins getting a dunk every so often down the floor. We are not going to live with Trey shooting threes and finding shooters and, and opening things up and, 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 you know, doing something like that. And for the Mavs to then follow that up, I mean, Tired late, I you know whatever. There's so many there's so many reasons why uh, this is a loss, but the fact that it, that just that type of effort and that type of strategy and that type of focus and that type of intensity, it just wasn't here. You know, I mean, it was obvious. Like you know, they it it, it doubled down, of course, because like <laughs> the Mavericks will not play another team again that plays you know five six six guys you know or whatever you know. Draymond Green at center, like I, it was kind of like a bad sum of all fears moment where it's like, uh oh, the Mavericks are on the second half of back to back where they are just horrendous this season. Give her, you know, COVID or not, like they, the F, you know, they are just getting their doors blown off on these back to backs. Uh, and then you compound that with, oh no, the Warriors, which they haven't done a lot of this season because they've actually been playing bigs. They've got James Weissman and Kevin, and Kevin Looney and Eric Paschal, like, they've been playing Draymond next to a center, uh, you know, as much as they can this season. So mm-hmm. almost like Steve Kerr, like he was forced to do this, to play basically five out for 48 minutes. Um, and it was just like the, a recipe for disaster because I'm sorry, but like everyone that is screaming for the Mavericks to dump all of their cap space into another big man, this is what it, this is what it might look like a lot of yeah. nights because this is what happens if you're going to have Kristaps Porzingis guard fours, or if yes. you want the center you signed to guard fours. I had some people come into me mentions and they're like, oh, well, how many teams are going to play like the Warriors tonight? And I'm like, yeah, this is the extreme outlier scenario. But guys, look around the league. A lot of teams play a shooter at the four. This yes. is not a rare scenario anymore. Yes, there are teams that still play two bigs. Uh, it's not completely extinct, but guys, like this but the is big how... can usually shoot. Like right. that's, I'm watching, like, like uh, uh, Lakers and Denver is on right now, and each of those teams has a shooting four. Right. This is and not. This is what, it, and this is what it looks like when you get Kristaps away from the rim. And this is, you know, this is almost not even fair to Kristaps. Obviously, he struggled. You know, Kirk, when you talked about the guys that were kind of shooting over and finishing over him at the rim, that was unacceptable. But, you know, when he's asked to guard, like, there were certain scenarios where, like, he's guarding Andrew Wiggins at the top of the at the top of the key or, you know, at the wing of the three-point line. And I don't care how great Kristaps is or how well he's playing. Like, that is not – that's not fair to him to be like, okay, you have to guard that now. Um, yeah. And when – if if the Mavericks – if the Mavericks dumped a bunch of cap space into another center, <laughs> we would be seeing that a lot. Yeah. Let me so, let me take a minute just to say that if if the Mavericks did do this, that w- that wouldn't be what KP does because KP doesn't venture beyond ten feet. Um, the the guy what was uh, uh T- T- Toscano Anderson hit a pair of threes, both of which were when KP was guarding him, and KP didn't even venture out of the lane. Um, that's just sort of of his deal now, and I don't know the 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 defensive principles when the Mavericks are humming we're still doing okay but I've seen enough now to where I you know and everybody's talking about this now I I, at least non-Mavericks fans on my timeline that I know are are who tune in and are watching KP for the first time that are like he just doesn't look right which is what I have been saying 
since after that rock that Rockets game, and our our lovely, very supportive, always always you know want to be on the side of the Mavs fan base gets very upset with me when I say these things. But he isn't looking right, and I don't see you know with the way the grind of these games, I don't see a way for him to get better. Uh, because it's not like there's rest time. They need him. You know, the Mavericks are playing a crazy um, uh, what do you, rotation right now. They're, they've They're cut playing seven guys, guys out. <laughs> yeah. I, and this just doesn't get any better because, you know, the, the, the funny thing to me in comparison to last season is Luca was often the problem last year. Luca is not the problem anymore. I mean, he's when, still you say, when you say problem, are you talking about defense? He's not the sole defensive problem, which okay, was okay, often okay. the case last year, where it'd be like, "Oh God, what? Like Luca, what are you doing?" I mean, he got he he's picking people's pockets. His hands are active. He's using his body. I think he still gives up a little bit too often on off ball watching. Where and it gives up is not the right way to phrase it, but he just kind of gets he gets lost in the commotion that happened to all the Mavericks tonight. But he's no longer the guy that I look to as as oh no, like it's Luca again making the mistake. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, okay. I just when you were talking about uh, it was Lucas, I, like I didn't know you meant defense. I was like, wait, wait, what are you Sorry. talking about? But yeah, you meant defense because that's really where like the the problem in the short term has to be the defense. I think that we can we can probably talk a little bit about the offense, and and I saw some conversations you were having that I I think were interesting that I want to circle back to. But if if they they told the you know the the Mavericks fan base they told the media that their goal was to play better defense it's really simple to say right now that they are not doing that thing and you know owner Mark Cuban has made an argument that there's you know COVID is is playing a big role in this and I don't want to say he's wrong but I also don't think that he is entire like I think there's a little bit of of scapegoating here because some of the mistakes that we're watching these Mavericks make, you know, Dorian Finney Smith is an excellent off ball defender and he got beat so badly on an out of bounds play cut to the rim where our, our whole slack was just like, what is happening? And I'm not sure how to correct these sorts of things because I, I, I feel like the only player who really looks like he's moving poorly after coming back from COVID is uh, Maxi. Uh, everyone else seems to, you know, Richardson seems to have a pep, uh, uh, you know, Dorian Finney like, is, is moving around well. It's just, it's kind of like a me- like mental lapse thing. I, I, I don't see where they correct this. Well, you hope that for whatever reason, Kirk, it, it, you hope that like the back-to-back thing is, is a thing. I mean, look, they lost by 40. The last time they played a back to back, they they lost to the Suns. It was close, but I think the the one they played before that was the Rockets, and it was another laugher, one thirty three, one hundred eight. Um, and then I think another back to I think I can't remember. I don't have the back to backs in front of me. Oh yeah, the, and then the the previous back to back after that was against the Raptors. They lost one sixteen ninety three. I don't know, like this <laughs> this back to back, like they could win. Like <laughs> there's a part of me that's like they're probably going to be competitive and win or and or win not saying they're gonna win on saturday but like these these the way that these back second night of the back-to-backs just feel like not even close like not even close to even be considered a watchable game or competitive game like that's just this season is very compact and they're gonna play more back-to-backs and they gotta find a way to just get a couple of scrap a couple of wins because you know, they look better on Saturday and then they play the Timberwolves. They'll probably look better because the Timberwolves are a hot mess right now. Um, yeah. And maybe we are feeling different, but it's just like, man, they got to they gotta figure out a way to avoid these like huge embarrassing losses on these second night of back-to-backs. And they got to find a way to be more competitive because you look at that Phoenix, the last time they played a back-to-back, they lost by one to Phoenix. Um and you th- or uh, sorry, they, yeah, they lost by actually six to Phoenix. They played Utah the night before. I like at least that was a game that was close. Where you like, you got to keep it close to like the, the, the random crap that happens in basketball games. Maybe just swings mm-hmm. in your favor. They're not giving themselves opportunities to steal wins or get cheap wins or get wins they don't deserve when the effort level is just this 
despicable. Like, I don't, it's a harsh word, but like, come on, man. They gave up <laughs> Kelly Oubre, who scored 40 points, who's been one of the worst players, worst uh, players in the, league. League. In the yeah. NBA, the worst sh- three point shooter in the league, Luca, number two, by the way. He hit mm-hmm. seven to 10 threes. Like, two of them were corner threes that came after the Mavericks made a basket and they were not, they were transition threes. They were the Warriors pass the ball up and one pass boom, he's open. And you got Mavericks guys pointing at each other. And it's like, guys, that's, you got to figure that out. And I know that, you know, maybe you're tired and when you're tired, it's easier to make more mistakes, but this whole, this whole season, you're going to be tired. Like, (laughs) I don't know when they're not going to be tired. This is probably the stretch. They're about to play. They just started their stretch of seven straight home games, so there's no travel. But the games are still coming. Like, it's still every other game. It's still every other day. So it's not like they're going to get a a two-day break or a three-day break, you know, or something like that. So they're going to be better, obviously, than this. And I think that they're going to be competitive in these next couple games. And I wouldn't be shocked if they won the next two games by, you know, five, six, seven, eight points. But like they can't keep having these mo- these nights where it all falls apart. They lose by thirty because they're just running out of rope. You know, like if they win two and then they lose, like if they win two, they lose one or two. Like they can't keep going back and forth with these games uh, because they've dug themselves in such a hole. I'm probably rambling, but it's just no, no. It's it's. I mean, that's just there's just not much more to say about the defense. I mean, Carlisle is is speaking to the media right now and he's taught he he gave a quote about how they got sucked into playing the warriors game and i don't agree with him at all they didn't get sucked into playing the warriors game they got sucked into playing terribly because they did not uh, God, uh, and now i'm watching kyle kuzma on my tv and he has the 100 emoji tattoo on his shoulder Ugh, sorry. <laughs> very distracting um the the offense to me is actually it, it has been a little bit of a concern and the fact that shots went down for a significant portion of the evening was nice, but it doesn't alleviate a single one of my concerns about the offense because there's just no movement. Um, the Mavericks do a lot of interesting off-ball things to get Luka going in different directions, but there was this Mike Prada piece at the beginning of the year that I might go dig up, see if I can find, that showed last season the Mavericks had tons of of off ball work when Luca was doing his slicing and dicing. There's none of that. Now there's a lot of standing Uh, secondarily. Nobody cares about the Maverick shooters, which we've talked about at length, but I don't understand how the offense gets this stagnant. Uh, I think Luca is really exhausted right now, to be quite honest, because he missed a ton of of shots around the rim tonight that he doesn't normally make his difficulty level on his floaters from like six or eight feet is just flabbergasting he's not taking hardly any easy layups the way he was getting last year absolutely and it, it, it it's really it's really really something that I, I i wish that i was smart enough to read into more other than you know, some of these these clips where you see both defenders camping in the short corners because they don't give a crap about who's shooting the ball. And and I, that has to be all played played together, right? Like, it's not just Luca not getting there. But I also think, and, and I'm, I'm getting this from some of my friends around the league who are, who are national kind of watchers, like, uh, you know, um, Seth Partnow said, said to me that Luca has zero burst. And I agree. Zero burst. And is that an effort of being tired? Is that an, an extension of, of being overweight still? I don't think so anymore, but he was quicker, frankly, to getting the hoop. I mean, he does more like lefty uh, uh, switch up dribbles now, which are kind of cool to watch. And then he, you know, makes a mid range shot, but the decisiveness and moving to the rim is not there right now. Um, and it feels compounding the way all these offensive issues feel compounding where just nothing is coming easy. Even when the Matt and, and, you know, to circle back to the defensive thing briefly that I, I want you to talk about, because you actually understand this stuff a little better than I do. How do the Mavericks not know who to pick up in after made baskets? How does that happen that often? Uh, I don't know. Uh, this is, 
something that I, if you've been following me, you, I point this out a lot, and it happened a lot last season. And Kirk, the only thing I could think about is uh, the Mavericks have some quality defenders in terms of like you know Josh Richardson, uh, Maxi Kleba, uh, and Dorian. Even though you know Dorian may frustrate us from time to time, but when I'm watching this team, it doesn't look like they're on the same page defensively. A lot of these possessions and it's a lot of like guys pointing and being like, Oh, 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 you're supposed to be there, mm-hmm. but I'm here. And it feels like, like the Mavericks need as much as Luca is like their floor general on offense. Doesn't it feel like they need the equivalent of that on defense? Uh, sort of like Tyson. I'm not saying they need a big, but remember when Tyson got here in 2011, he was barking out everything. Like right. he's telling guys, hey, screens are coming. Hey, you know, they're switching here. They're doing this. They're doing a cross screen here. You know, they're flaring out. This is happening. Uh, the Mavericks don't seem to have a guy like that on their team. They don't, you know, Richardson is probably the most uh, accomplished defender they have on the roster right now in terms mm-hmm. of like veteran experience and skins on the wall. But, you know, he's also a guard. And it's sometimes tough for guards to be like the you know the biggest uh, you know barker on, on defensive end, and it seems like he does talk like he seems like the guy that has the most energy on the defensive end. He really gets into it, but I just see like a passive team that isn't talking a lot, and then they're pointing fingers when a guy's sitting wide open in the corner after a made bucket, yeah. uh, and that's frustrating. And that just goes to show like they need you know a lot of these guys, you know Maxi and and Dorian and. Um, you know, they're undrafted free agents, you know, they're guys that have played really well, but you just, you, maybe they need one more defensive presence that has the skins on the wall and has been there before. Uh, maybe that would help. Uh, but I don't know. It's just, it, it seems like they're not talking enough, but that's something that I could be pulling out of my ass uh, because I am not at practices. I am not, uh, you know, talking to the guys after every game. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but can I bring up Kirk? You talked about the offense and you're wondering about Luca at the rim. Yes. Um, I just pulled it up while you're bringing that up because our friend Bobby Corrala and I had a discussion about this last night about Luca taking more mid range shots and not taking enough shots at the rim. He brought up about how the Mavericks basically, you know, look at what Luca shot, uh, his shot charts when Dwight Powell was on the floor uh, last season before his injury. And you think about the Mavericks' role threat and how much that was a huge part of their offense until Powell got hurt. Yep. And, Kirk, I've got the role man numbers uh, loaded up for you. Um, the two Mavericks who lead uh, the team in, in role, pick and roll role man possessions are Willie Cauley-Stein at 47, Chris Stops Porzingis at 42. Uh, Willie Cauley-Stein is, shooting one, is scoring 1.06 points per possession. That's good for the 48th percentile. Mm-hmm. Chris Stops is shooting is scoring 1.12 points per possession. That's the 60th percentile, which is a little bit better, but not that great. Uh, the next highest is Powell. He's in the 46th percentile now. He's, <laughs> he's sadly only scoring 1.05 points per possession, which like that is just astounding and just goes to show his Achilles injury. Uh, Maxi's leading the team. He's 1.33. That's 84. 84- points per possession that's 84th percentile but he just hasn't played and he hasn't looked good since he's come back from, from well and Luca makes the game so easy for these post players yeah. and it really last night we didn't really talk about this just because we needed to move on but last night was basically the john collins edition for for the mavericks um it, you know he's he's going to be a restricted free agent so uh, it's that that sort of thing should be kind of interesting but yeah, but- it, having a big role man or having a decent or willing role man. That's what I'm going to say. Willing. Um, I, I wanted to Kenny, the jet Smith was, you know, I don't really, the TNT show is kind of a mess, but Kenny, the jet basically showed his, in his, one of his segments showed how often Porzingis was kind of needlessly popping. Uh, and frankly, the defender did not care that he would flare. Like Steph Curry was 15 feet away from him. That alone is evidence that you know the Porzingis at three right now is not something that or shooting the three ball is not something that scares teams, and he has to go to the rim more. He just has to. He's effective. He's scary. Like the, we have like evidence of this. I think it's part of why I get so like rage inducing about it because he's he you know he's seven three and in a straight line there's really not much teams can do other than foul him, you know. Yeah, and, and it would be great to just mix enough. it up. 
Yeah, you know, yeah. If he, he he hit some threes off the pick and pop tonight, which was nice. But, you know, he hasn't been hitting threes all season. Mm -hmm. uh, but he needs to hit threes. Like, it, it can't go away. Uh, but, yeah, it's just they don't – when a, basically, when a big sets a screen, I don't think defenses care. Um, no. They don't care about the big setting the screen. They're like, all right, well, let's just send more guys at Luka. And when – last year, I mean, <laughs> it just goes to show what an Achilles injury can do to a player. Like – my God, Dwight Powell was literally like the one of the best in the league uh, as being a rim runner, and now he is in the bottom half. Uh, and to lose that from your offense, and like it, it's crazy how much that opens things up. And it doesn't just it's it opens things up in terms of you're getting more points at the rim because you've got an efficient roller that can finish. You're getting more points at the rim because you're giving Luka Doncic better driving lanes, and you're forcing defenses to make decisions. Uh, between two thing, two things that are, you know, they don't want Dwight getting a dunk, but they also don't want Luka getting a layup. You're right. forcing decisions, which is like, that's what you do as an offense. you got to force defenses to make tough decisions because they can't take away everything if you're executing well. So there's two two sources. And then the third is those rim rolls when it's effective. Now you've got defenders crashing into the paint and you're opening up more shots for your shooters. Uh, I don't think it's been – the Maverick shooters have been so bad that defense, defenders are still leaving them open and they're still missing. But mm -hmm. it, it all – it's a cascading effect where it really, really, uh, I think, is dampering a lot of the offense. And this has been a Rick staple for, like, how many years now? Oh, yeah. Basically, yeah. It's like, this is the first year in a while that I can remember the Mavericks just having zero – uh, as a role man, basically since, you know, the 2011 season when they first got Tyson. And I think they started incorporating that more into their game. I mean, it, was, it was a huge part of what ground the offense to a halt after they uh, traded for Rajon Rondo and sent away Brandon Wright back in yeah. the day because Powell yes. was not playing. Right. And they just had, they had an aspect of their offense that was really helping them just, just get stripped away. And there's there's just no... You know, it goes back, gosh, we talk about this like every couple of days, and I'm sure people are sick of it, but this is why we were so sick during free agency. I don't know. We don't need to revisit that. But, you know, <laughs> they, they they play again, the same team, on Saturday night, and they have to do something differently. They have to show something. This was, We talked about this being the time. I'm not sure what comes next. I don't know what sort of what sort of things would even be available to them because their assets are all negative right now. Like there's Luca. That's kind of it. It's like I, you, you know, you guys could tell me, and I'm sure people will. Well, KP had a better game tonight. He did have a better game tonight. I'm not gonna lie. Like he had five, five of eight from three. He had some shots inside the lane. He did the he did some cool face ups and actually hit shots. He also still missed a fair amount. <laughs> yeah. um, he only had five rebounds for a seven foot three man. I, you know, I, but the, I, the, I, hope, I, the hope is you just bad. Yeah. <laughs> the hope is you just, you, they recalibrate. They, they're not on a back to back. They win on Saturday because they play off, you know, they get another good KP game and their defense isn't as embarrassing as it is tonight. And they're more prepared for a potential five out offense. Then you play the Wolves, who are a trash fire team, and all of a sudden you you know you're looking at two wins in a row, and like that's like as sucky as it sounds. Like you ask for like what's the answer? What change? Like that? It's just the schedule will change, and the schedule will make it easier for them, regardless of whether they're actually changing or not. Um, they play the Warriors again on Saturday, then the Wolves, Hawks, Pelicans. Uh, you know. The Wolves, like I said, they're not doing so hot. The Hawks are in a bad way. They've got a lot of guys missing right now. The Mavericks just played them uh, and played them pretty well until they kind of farted around at the end of the fourth quarter. Um, and then the Pelicans are kind of a mess also. So the Mavericks might – they still – after that Pelicans game, it's it would not shock me if they had won – if we're talking about their fourth win in a row. But we're also still at the same time going, I don't know how much they've fixed. You know, like – these problems could still exist, and they also might still win four in a row just because yeah. the schedule's being nice to them for once. I mean, I would uh, I, I would much rather be like I don't know who these Mavs are rather than I feel like these Mavs are a trash fire. Like that's 
like I, I I said something earlier today. Gosh, I was I was talking basketball with the with the Wolves, uh, with the Timberwolves fan, and I said, and uh, you know, because they haven't fired their very bad coach, and and it's uh, so apparently it's something along the lines of of they're not sure, like the interim is just not somebody they'd be confident in. I'm not really sure what the deal would be, but I, I just uttered the phrase, you know, sometimes a different version of hell is refreshing. And that's what's been so awful about this, you know, seven out of eight game stretch now that the Mavericks have lost in that it's just so much of the same stuff. Like tonight was was bad defense because of low effort and the effort has been a problem and it's just not getting any better. And, you know, you watch and read the post game quotes and I don't see how it does get better because they don't have good enough players. The pieces all fit together a certain way last year. And after the Mavericks started 16 and six, Luca got injured in Miami and nothing was ever the same. It's been a rough stretch since then. Not awful, but not up to expectations and really not up to the Mavs abilities as much as expectations. And that's kind of why we're, why we're here. Yep. And we just, they got, a, I don't know what, yeah, you, you summed it up. But like I said, I'm, I'm struggling to to figure out what else to say uh, about this team because it's like you said it's the same things and and we'll see. It wouldn't sh- like I said it wouldn't shock me if they ripped off four in a row here uh and you know we'll, hopefully they can do that cuz they just played their first game of a seven game home stand and they got a loss. So like I said I said they cannot finish the seven game home stand worse than a four and three. So they need to get some wins here. Yeah, there. Yeah, so well, we'll be back. They play Saturday night. Uh, same team, same place, same us. Uh, hopefully with better defense, both from us and the Mavericks. And you know, uh, till then we will, uh, you know, talk to you guys out there. Josh, you got anything else? No, that that's it. <laughs> that's it. All right, guys, we'll talk to you in a couple of days. Have a good one. <laughs>